Okay, great. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. It's uh, been such a great conference so far. I've really enjoyed the uh, diversity of uh, things we've been talking about. Uh, my name is Oliver Holtaway. Um, among the many things I do, I'm involved with the um, community ownership movement in the UK. Um, and in particular, uh, in particular, I've been involved with Bath City Football Club, a small football club in mean, Bath, where I'm from. <coughs> uh, recently, last year, uh, took from private ownership into community ownership. So, like um, about 40 or 50 other football clubs around the UK, um, we raise the, a lot of money from the community to buy a majority stake, and we now control the club uh, on a sort of democratic, mutual, cooperative basis. Um, and what, what I wanted to talk about today was, or what I wanted to kind of think through today, is the you know, what innovation and maintenance mean in the context of these kind of community takeovers, in the context of community ownership. Um, I'll start by briefly talking about the campaign itself and how uh, language of innovation and language of maintenance uh, play a part in trying to inspire people to get involved with the campaign. Um, and then I'll probably spend more of my talk um, considering uh, how the innovations that have occurred um, have created new maintenance obligations and how we're dealing with that in terms of our division of labour. So starting with the campaign, um, I mean, like, like most uh, uh, community, uh, community, community takeovers, um, you usually have to raise a large sum of money in order to take over the thing you're trying to take over. Um, we're talking here about private assets. So, you know, a private business like a football club or a, a pub is another common example. But if for some reason they're facing commercial pressures or under stress or under strain, and you need to inspire people to look to see a better future for that football club or pub that they'll put the money into, but also win an argument around why a community ownership model will succeed uh, where a private ownership model will fail. And looking back to the language that we use around the Bath City campaign, I think it's quite common language for these kind of campaigns. We talked a lot about revitalization, about renewal, about refreshing the asset, about attracting um, fresh ideas. Uh, fresh skills, fresh talent. So we're really leaning into, I think, the language of, of, of innovation, um, more so than maintenance. And in fact, we even, to some extent, we're saying that one of the flaws with the private ownership model, and bear in mind this is at a club where they were, we always rely on volunteers because they're, they're small, so they're small of income. With the private ownership model, you had a handful of private owners who were running the club on a voluntary basis, and they only had time for maintenance. They only had time just to keep the basic compliance going with the club, and there was no room for uh, creativity, strategic thinking, or, or innovation. So the story we told in getting people excited about it was really leaning towards this sense of it'll be new, it'll be fresh, it'll be revitalized. Um, now, how was that supposed to happen? Here, we started to lean into the language of maintenance, because we said, if there are more owners, if there's a wider ownership base, there will be more people who feel invested and involved in maintaining it. It's the argument that if you actually own something, you will do a better job of maintaining it. It's a slightly problematic argument, but you know, that's the argument we were, we were using. But for the most part, we were inspiring people through creativity, innovation, renewal. Uh, this worked. I mean, it was successful in terms of you know, a, a, the campaign hitting its target. We raised at Bath City um, £365,000 and took a majority stake. Uh, there were about, about, about 600 people um, contributed to that and became members of this new cooperative. Um, and we took control in April last year. Uh, so what's happened since then? Um, we certainly have had a lot of innovation uh, and then new thinking, new things happening. And that certainly has created a whole host of new maintenance obligations. Um, at the most fundamental level, the innovation is our, our model. We're now a cooperative, essentially, essentially cooperatively run as a majority shareholder. And cooperatives are nothing new, but in football, they're relatively new. In British football, they're relatively new. Um, to, to make it happen, we have to create all kinds of new democratic mechanisms. Uh, you know, people have to write standing orders, um, election policies, procedures. Essentially, create sort of a democratic manual um, to actually run, run the club. This then created a host of maintenance obligations around governance, maintaining a membership list, tracking subscriptions, people paying into their membership, um, running elections, having um, election observers, um, minutes of meetings, 
basic uh, commitments to member communication and transparency. All of this kind of takes some work. And I think if we're being honest, for the first year, we have faced some challenges in actually delivering on the promises we made to members around the amount of democracy and transparency they would receive, because many of the people who design the system, I'm, I'm one of them, um, ended up stepping away for various reasons. They kind of, kind of left the manual, handed the manual over, but it, it wasn't always read, it wasn't always followed through, it wasn't always understood. So there, there's still work to do there in terms of embedding the democracy um, element um, of the community ownership model, at least with our club. Um, turning to the operations of the club, how the club's kind of engaging with the community, um, again, we're doing lots of new things. Um, the marketing and the branding of the club is completely transformed from the regular base to very kind of high frequency, high tempo, and high quality, I think, um, level, level, level of communication. The match day experience has been transformed. There are more people involved in you know, There's more for families to do. There's more elements to the match day experience. Um, and our, our efforts to engage the community in Bath, uh, both business, charity, other kind of organizations, has become a lot more structured and is, is, is a lot richer. And we're seeing a lot of, a lot of benefit from that. Um, uh, and there is a real sense of new energy in the club. But how has that happened? And again, what kind of maintenance obligations have been created? Did this volunteer army arrive that we promised? Sort of. It's a slightly mixed picture in terms of who's actually stepped forward. There's not much evidence from what we can see that the new owners, those 600 people, have become any more inclined than they were before to volunteer in kind of maintenance type roles. Um, there were people who were already doing it, who bought in, and there are a few no 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 notable exceptions of people who did to put the money forward and then say, right, I may as well come in and make this work if I put my money in. But for the most part, people seem to have taken the approach, well, I've given you my money, and now, you know, now you can go and do it. Um, we have attracted people, I think, after the fact. A lot of our greatest uh, kind of new volunteers um, didn't put in money initially, didn't know about the whole community takeover. But now that we've done that, they are attracted to the idea of the club, and they sort of come in, and they you know, include students, we build links with the universities in Bath, um, and the college uh, professionals who want to kind of lend their professional skills to the club, and, and your children as well, kind of your teenage, teenagers and, and below. Thinking about those new volunteers who are kind of coming in to help the club, if you try to get a kind of breakdown of how many are coming in sort of innovation roles or kind of new things, and how many are coming in to do maintenance roles, um, I guess the fear was always that everyone would want to come in and do the new things, and no one would want to wash the dishes, so to speak. Um, in the event, it's been fairly even, I would say. Um, it's probably a bit more difficult to find the maintainers than the innovators, but we have found some. People have come forward to do things like to literally maintain the pitch, um, to work the turnstiles, to deliver posters and all the pubs and everything. So as well as having the kind of creative minds coming in and developing the amazingly poster campaign, we are finding people who actually go around and put the posters up. Um, but it's slightly more difficult. Uh, I think the main difference, to some extent, is maybe my own personal reputation, but one of the main differences is that we don't quite understand why maintainers come forward. We understand why creators come forward and do creative things. We understand why you know, the head of a brand agency in Bath comes forward and wants to launch a new brand campaign. We're not quite sure why a senior charity professional puts his hand up to say, I'll oh, just organize the delivery of posters. We don't quite know why. And it just seems very kind of different reasons for different people which makes it difficult to kind of be strategic about how you recruit and retain and keep volunteers happy. You don't quite understand what's motivating them. Um, so yeah, that said, we have a good mix of, of, kind of both um, innovators and maintainers. Um, but it, it, it must be recognized that the innovations are creating more maintenance obligations, more new maintenance obligations, on top of the ones that we already had anyway, um, than the volunteer structure itself can handle. Um, we did anticipate this, so as part of our business plan as a community and club, we um, we made provision for a paid general manager. So we have a general manager who's paid to have you know, certain roles and responsibilities that she takes on. But one kind of additional role that's kind of evolved is that she essentially becomes sort of, sort of a backstop, or sort of um, an excess of reserve capacity to take on 
the maintenance obligations from all the new ideas coming forward that haven't yet been absorbed by the volunteer structure. So I guess, the, you know, and this, this is challenging for her, um, and it probably takes up a disproportionate amount of her time. So looking to the future, I think we essentially have two challenges that we are uh, looking to achieve at the past of the year. And I, I suppose the way I would um, kind of conceptualize this would be, the first is, how do you build a sort of membrane between your kind of your backstop, your paid backstop, the maintainers will come in and organize the pitch or wear the mascot uniform to do as they think they have to be done. And in between that, you need sort of a volunteer layer of sort of maintenance managers or people to maintain the maintainers almost and do this quite specific work of, I mean, you know, I'll give you a couple of examples. I mean, I've already talked about the posters. So as well as people who will say, I don't mind putting a few up in my neighborhood, just post them to me. You need to find that person who keeps that list, who makes sure all the bits of bath are being covered, who then makes sure when you know, collects the posters each month, mails them out. That kind of role, that kind of maintaining the maintainers. Um, another example would be our, our mascot. We have a, a mascot which is a, a pig, for historical reasons. <laughs> uh, going back to the family of bath by King Gladys, so we have Gladys the pig. There's about four or five people who, for some reason, know none of themselves, volunteer to dress up as this pig and, you know, our match days run around, you know, and, and when we do our kind of schools program, we go to schools, we you know, we'll take part in these events. And you know, for, at, at first, it was a, the paid general manager who had to organise all that. The pig now has a handler. We now have a <laughs> pig, and that's our agent kind of farms people out, you know, at certain times. So we found that person. Um, another quite interesting one is uh, we, we on our match days now, when the players come out at the start of the match, we have uh, local school kids form a guard of honour. Uh, sort of wave flags and all sort of thing. Um, and there, again, the general manager set that up and would oversee it. And there was one day when she was just kind of distracted and just couldn't get back, she was given some other emergency. And a 13 year old female you know, girl volunteer just kind of just you know, stepped forward and just kind of took charge of the situation <laughs> and made sure everyone was standing in the right place because you know, she'd done it a few times before. And she now manages that. That's not her job. So she's sort of taking on that. So, I guess, I mean, I, I'm you know, thinking about the, the types of leadership. Um, you know, it's moving to a space where there's kind of distributed leadership where people will take on these little tasks that almost sit just one level above the actual maintenance, if that makes sense. Yeah, maintaining the maintenance, kind of building that membrane out, I think is, 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 uh, is quite important. Um, but then, again, so, I mean, so that's a kind of structural or an organizational thing. I think to achieve that and to, and to get more people maintaining in general, we need to look at ways of fostering a culture of maintenance, kind of celebrating maintenance. Um, there's one example of that I think is quite is you know, quite good, and we should maybe do more of. Um, I mean, yeah, it's something that I would almost call, you know, an, an, an academic might call performative maintenance. Um, the example I would use would be uh, last summer um, we did a big thing called a big, big sort of event called Paint Park. Um, so touring parks are around. So Paint the Park was saying to the whole community, we just become community owned, say to everyone who just bought the club, um, let's all go down two Saturdays this summer and we will you know, paint and you know, sweep and you know, strip all the paint away. Um, just basically freshen the appearance of the whole ground up um, before the start of the season. And you know, they have pieces of beers afterwards. Um, when we first went to the, sort of the people who had always done that, and say, you know, we want to do this and open it up to everyone, have a big kind of make the whole thing of They sort of said, well, we did that 10 years ago, and actually, you know what, it's more work than it's worth. You know, when you've got people coming in who barely know which you know, end of the paintbrush to hold, you know, it, you know is, is it really worth it? You know, it's, it's more efficient if we just, just don't do that. And we have to make the case of saying, well, actually, this, this is as much about ritual, as much about kind of community building and celebration that we should all be willing to pitch in in these kind of very basic tasks that aren't just about us kind of, you know, doing our own special you know, skill or whatever. Um, you know, it, this is really about ritual and community building. Um, and you know, we went ahead, it, it was very successful, a lot of people came down, and, you know, and those people were swayed, you know, the, the original people who were skeptical, who swayed <coughs> to, the, to, you know, to, to, to the wisdom of, of, of the idea. And so I think building more of those kind of rituals, I and mean, in football, of course, it's seasonal, so you sort of have indoor rituals, 
building that kind of ritual and thinking more about how you can be performative around celebrating maintenance is something for us to investigate more in the future. And I will certainly go back in this conference with ideas from that. So thank you very much.